Okay, this is the, um, I, I don't do it as well as Henry would, but uh, my job. Wow. This is the uh, panel discussion, which was supposed to be a blockbuster because there was no competition with it, but apparently there's competition in some people's minds. Um, and it is, uh, well, let me tell you something. When we started this um, proposal for this conference, we noted that Phoenix is the largest metropolitan area in the country that doesn't have a National Space Society chapter. So in lieu of that, we've assembled a panel of three Phoenicians to talk about... Uh, is there. Yeah, now we know. It's quiet. It's wonderful. Finding common ground. You, you can see how strange they are, why there's no NSS chapter. And, uh, that will become clear over the uh, course of this, uh, this panel discussion. Uh, we've got Pete Manley, uh, a science fiction author, uh, have you been selling books? Uh, a couple. Yeah, Pete's got a book for sale. If you see one under his arm, offer to buy it. Uh, we've got Leslie Fish, who's a writer and folk singer. And we've got Henry Vanderbilt, who is a, a more recent import to Phoenix, I think, and he's president of the so Space Access now. Society. Executive director, I insist. Executive President's director paid more. <laughs> of the Space Access Society. And have to do less. And the topic of their discussion is, Finding Common Ground and Competing Visions for Near-Term Space Development. And, you know, they won't, you can't expect someone will stick greatly to that, but the idea is, what can we do together that's not competing with each other? Can't we all get along? Okay. Uh, one, one addendum to the introduction, I thought the reason I was on this thing is that I spent 30 years in uh, the space program with the Air Force and NASA and then industry. Um, and then and retired to chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not retired and I'm a writer, but uh, was in on the launch of Apollo 15, 16, and 17 in the build of uh, I don't know how many spacecraft. But uh, I've seen the engineering side of this, this business. Okay, I've never spent any time dealing with hardware of space flight. I'm just a science fiction fan and writer. But I spent 30 years as uh, working in uh, grassroots politics for, the, uh, for various radical causes. The civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the labor movement, radical labor movement, please. And uh, learned some interesting tactics which I think could be of help. And I'm here, well, partly because Tom was desperate, but, <laughs> no, but seriously. No, I, I, I was watching this movement from afar for 10 years, and I've been involved in it for another 15 years, so I have some idea of the actual practical considerations involved in trying to get people pointed in all, all in the same direction other than briefly and by accident. Uh, I'm here to take the devil's advocate position, by the way. I don't think there is a great deal of prospect on most subjects for getting the, the, the breadth of the space movement all pointed in the same direction. I think it's, in fact, a good thing that we're basically divided up into groups that pursue the aspects of the problem that we're interested in pursuing. I think you get more focused enthusiasm that way. You get more individual successes. Being an anarchist say, ooh, doesn't that scare anybody anymore? Okay, I'm all for diversity and, uh, and decentralization. Uh, however, I also know from a practical standpoint that we have 100 groups of five people each pushing for different uh, uh, for different programs, each of which is going to cost an arm and a leg, uh, you do not get off the ground. What you do is you get uh, uh, one group of 500 people all pushing in the same direction. Even if it's only for six months, you will, will get something to move. Now, the phenomenon I saw during the uh, jolly days of the anti-war protests is that uh, having a single task, stop the war now, prove the kingpin around which uh, hundreds of different social reform groups could coalesce, everything from the, uh, the vegetarians to the uh, Quakers uh, to gay rights and so on, all but it had this one central simple task. And regardless of what the FBI might think, the, uh, probably the most single and best, most effective organization for that whole cultural movement was something called the MOB, Mobilization to End the War. They, it was a task group and they had only one task. That task was organizing anti-war protests. And from that, that one simple task of drew uh, millions of people together in these massive protests, uh, letter writing campaigns and everything else, which did eventually uh, damn it, end the war. Once the war was over and that kingpin was pulled, all these groups uh, diverged away to their own uh, particular uh, specialties. 
And what I observed, what I saw from that, is that if you can come up with one simple, one step task uh, that will arouse everybody's interest, you can get all these different groups to push in one direction long enough to get that one task done. And that's what I push for now. Yeah. Uh, my and I will. My experience in this movement is there is no such task. We've been looking for it for a while, that we haven't had such a unified task since we went to the moon. Uh, the closest I've been able to come up with anything like that is solving the transportation problem. Mm -hmm. I've been working that angle because it is about as close as you come to common ground. Everybody mm -hmm. who's genuinely interested in going out there and doing things will acknowledge that transportation is a problem, and it would be a lot easier to do what they want to do if transportation was cheaper and required less political clout and less lead time to get. And even so, I can tell you from personal experience that uh, aside from a general consensus that the transportation problem needs solving, if you put a dozen space advocates in a room and ask them how to go about solving it and what's the best possible way, you're going to get about a dozen and a half answers all very loudly. Well, I will agree with Leslie on this, and, and there's a monumental statement that I would agree with Les Fish. Uh, <laughs> and, and differ politely with, with uh, Henry. Well, there's, that, there, there's unprecedented. He's differing, differing politely. <laughs> <laughs> One of those days, Henry. Pete and I go back a ways. <laughs> anyway, uh, we discussed this a little bit before the, the, the panel, and uh, I think that focusing your energies on one problem is uh, probably the best first step. There have been a lot of very nice uh, presentations on lunar colonies and Mars landers and things like that, but I think what you have to do first is to get to low Earth orbit and not be limited to that as the outer bounds. And you need, need to live, live, that is, every day in low Earth orbit. Right now we send people up to the shuttle and the ISS, we bring them all back home. There is nobody who's got a zip code of outer space. And I think that's what we have to establish first. The way to get there, pick a design. There's a couple of good ones out there. I would say either DCX or Rotary Rocket are both capable of getting out there. Uh, we've been putting people in space for, what, what was the number you gave me, Henry? 43 years? Since 50, yeah, well, people in space. You didn't say that. You said going to space. Okay. 39 years. 39 years. And the, the technical engineering problem of getting into space is solved. Okay, we got several ways to do it. Let's go do it. But we all need to get behind that particular program to get it done. Once we get out there, we get on orbit, we're living, and we can get to the moon, then it all speeds up. But right now, we're sitting here blocked at station zero now, looking for step one. Now, the, there's, where the, there's where you're your, your position is great in theory, but uh, get behind that program. The problem is, you're assume, I assume you're, you're talking about a government program there. No. No. You're talking about privately? Yes. yes. Cool. Ray, go, raise, go raise some investment money for those companies. Here's how. That's going to be the first step. Take the first baby step. Okay, choose one of those new designs, Rotary and DCX. And, uh, well, there, is a, there is a company that still wants to build that configuration. It's called Universal Space Lines, USL. Pete Conrad, who was the pilot of DCX, founded it. Lost him in a motorcycle accident about a year ago. But Jess Sponable, who was the Air Force manager, and Bill Gobetz, who was the McDonnell Douglas manager for the program, are both working there. Get and me their phone numbers. Right, what do their phone numbers do for you? You can get them on uh, Sponable at VIX.com. You can get to them. Okay. Actually... actually Spacelines.com, that's the company name. Spawnable at Spacelines.com, Gobats at Spacelines.com are the email addresses. And what they need is money. They are There's spending all their time right now trying to shake loose some money. All right, there's our answer. You can't get settlers going west without Conestoga waves. And the Conestoga we're talking about cost an arm and a leg. This, this is the blockage. This is, this is the uh, choke point. Therefore, let's choose Spacelines and everybody go out and uh, 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 start a big money campaign, a big campaign writing to private investors, idle rich, uh, poor folks who, can, uh, who might be persuaded to spend a dollar on this instead of on the lottery. 
and get everybody to pour money into this one you can't, baby step. You can't collect money from poor folks a bucket at a time. The SEC comes around and arrests you. They're, not they're going to arrest qualified. 10 million poor folks. They're not qualified investors. you got to protect poor folks from getting the retirement money and you're fleeced away from them. And they do these days. Uh, it, it's been thought of. Okay, in that case, what uh, the very next step is, let's find a uh, safe way. Money. You can shake down rich people. You can't shake down poor people a bucket. You can shake down rich people a hundred thousand at a time. You can't shake down poor people a bucket at a time for these things. Shaking down poor people is the exclusive province of government. <laughs> okay, let's get right. the middle class and the working class then. Whatever. We'll be put some charitable organization or whatever the hell the legal term is. Obviously, first we need a lawyer to find out the uh, uh, other way of the minefield. We go out and we campaign to put money into as it, what's it called again? Space lines. Uh, universal space lines. Universal space lines. Okay. We also uh, have you talked with the folks who are running universal space lines about how they can market the product, which is, hey, if we get enough money, we can build a reliable rocket that will go up and come down and bring payloads every time, and then we can sell this service to whoever is uh, putting up satellites, whoever is putting up the space station. It doesn't matter if the space station is total frost. You can make money selling the, selling the transport of the government. Well, there is a commercial space station up there now, and you probably will be able to make money transporting <coughs> things to and from it. It's run by Russians. Fine. <laughs> Capitalists in space. They have Russian <laughs> access. Big Who'd Jim have space. Who would have thought that? Isn't it marvelous about the time that communism is collapsing everywhere else in the world is being pushed by the American government? Uh, well, at, at one, I, I've been told that at one point during the Russian moon program, all the competing design organizations have been, you know, slicing each other's throats and stabbing each other's backs and in general brawling un unmercifully, were brought together by the head of the program and he pointed at NASA and said, now there is a good socialist organization for you, imitate them, cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> well, my local socialist organization is proved total frost, nothing but white collar feather bedding. Mm. Well, and any government bureaucracy you know, degenerates to that eventually. And ASSA's had 42 years since it was formed. It's a couple of generations. Before that, they were NACA. Yeah. yeah. And under a different structure, and they are actually, actually more or less useful. NACA? Yeah. I've got, an, I've got an engineer friends who will tell me they still use old NACA reports, but at some point in the early, or early 60s, when they changed the middle consonant, they started going downhill. Mm -hmm. Figures. The fewer the initials and the acronym, the, the, uh, the more ossified and less flexible they are. Mm. But, <coughs> okay, so we sidestep now. So if we can come up, if we can, by putting support and uh, you know, time, effort, money, attention into this one company that can finally build workable, reliable rockets and can then offer to sell the service, then they can sell the service to me who's paying, the Russians. <coughs> the, uh, of the uh, ISS, and eventually NASA will jump on the bandwagon, just as you always collect energies after you've made a success. I'm not sure I want NASA to jump on the bandwagon. Well, they will. I've seen what. a couple of, of development programs which had uh, very good ideas and very good engineers, and they were very small. When NASA joins your, your outfit, they, they bring along about a dozen other alphabet agencies and you start having to deal with OSHA and Department of Commerce, if there's anything international. Department of State. State Department these days. Yeah. So we avoid them as long Whatever as possible. Whatever that is. And uh, a small organization, which was initially you know, three engineers, a secretary, and 10 technicians, has got uh, 150 managers. <laughs> and most of those managers are not going to go into space. They don't know anything about space, but they do know how to deal with all the alphabet agencies of the government, and they're on your payroll. Mm -hmm. I really don't think you want to get involved with NASA. You avoid them as long as possible, but inevitably they'll come sniffing around. Meanwhile, you have to have a fleet complete, making enough money to hold them off. And okay, so you build, you are running this one company, you build your rockets, you sell its services to anybody but NASA until you start making enough money to make it commercially viable. Right. Well, first you have to get enough, first you have to get the several hundred million minimum it takes to develop this ship. That's the uh, first step. I, I see 50 people in this room. If we all put up a thousand apiece, well, we'll keep the lights on in the office for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the only way I know to raise money with this few people, uh, none of whom are, uh, Bill Gates is, Bill, are you out there? No? Okay. Uh, all right, it's the other Bill Gates. Uh, the only way I know to shake loose money with this few people is to shake it loose from the government. Uh, now, you might say that could be a problem because NASA took this technology and flew it into the ground five years ago and has been refusing to follow it on ever since. But they meant to literally sabotage it, they couldn't have done a better job. Well, it was, it was subtler than that. They just left all the workers out in the New Mexico desert 800 miles from home for three months straight while they putzed around and delayed, and they spent at least half of that time not paying them because the paperwork on their checks was screwed up. So it got to be July in the New Mexico desert, and one of them made a silly mistake. One of the mechanics forgot to reattach a pneumatic line to the landing gear legs after being out in the desert for 15 months not getting paid and working in 110 degree heat all day long. Uh, Whose fault is that? No, it's obviously the mechanic's fault and, and the company's fault for not having a detailed checklist for a competent mechanic. Uh, that, that's what NASA will tell you if you could get hold of a copy of their accident report, which you can't because they haven't released it. But I digress. Uh, the way I know to get loose the money, despite the fact NASA doesn't like it, is called an earmark. You get a uh, powerful congressman and appropriations in the Senator House to say to, to add in on his own say-so with his friends in Congress wording in the bill that funds NASA that year saying that NASA will spend $15 million on a vertical takeoff, vertical lander rocket. Uh, you practically write in it will be made by USL, by the old DCX team. Uh, and we're trying to do this. The House just passed their, uh, didn't pass their appropriation, it got out of committee with no earmarks whatsoever because they're going through another big economy squeeze. The, the way this usually works is they have bad cop, good cop. The Senate will come along and re-add a lot of earmarks next month. So we're going to work the Senate for that. Uh, we may have, Buzz, Buzz Aldrin's company also lost their earmark, which is why they were upset the other day, Buzz and, and, and his, his guy. Uh, they lost their earmark and they didn't get a NASA con. Neither USL nor Buzz Aldrin's con money company got a contract, got a study contract from NASA's you know, Space Launch Initiative to look at their ideas any further. NASA basically said, no, no, it's not what we're looking for. You'd actually take a lot of people into space and we're not interested and didn't give them any study contracts, which is why Buzz was a little upset, although he was you know, too polite to say specifically why mm -hmm. nobody was listening to him. Uh, as I said, next month the, uh, the Senate's going to be marking up their appropriation, and if the 50 people in this room want to help, uh, check our website, www.space-access.org. Keep an eye on it. Uh, join Space Access Society and get on our mailing list and get it emailed directly to you when the situation comes up. And frankly, 50 people, 50 literate, sensible people, Is that write, writing, writing their congressman, 50 literate, sensible letters coming into various congressional offices can do a stunning amount because their assumption is that for anything that comes in, at least 10, 10 to 100 more out there aren't bothering to write. Okay, this is how to stampede a congressman. Which congressman do we choose to target and stampede? Find the weak point of the, you know, the opposition. That's it. Who do we go after? Give me a name. Well, here in Arizona, actually, we don't want to stand for either. <coughs> uh, Senator Kyle is on the Senate Appropriations uh, VA HUD subcommittee, which funds NASA, which is in a position to put an earmark in. Okay. Everybody, go out and uh, browbeat Senator Kyle to, uh, to put a writer on the next bill providing funding for USL to build a. Uh, uh, an Earth to orbit shuttle. Yeah, be well, very specific. Hammer the hammer the nail head only. Nothing not the board beside it. They're not that ambitious right now. They're, they're, uh, politics is the art of the possible. They're looking for enough to build a DCX follow-on. They'll go they'll go to multiple mock uh, go up to the edge of the atmosphere that they'll be able to trundle around unfueled in the back of a pickup truck to air shows once they've finished you know uh, flight testing it at White Sands. Pickup truck? Yes, pickup truck. All right. It's a little bigger than that, isn't it? The one they're planning on building isn't. I mean, the, the oh, current DCX. Huh? The, the, the current design of DCX. We'll talk to Greg Allison. The remains of the current DCX could probably, you know, fit in the back of a pickup truck. Well, yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. No, the current, the, the, the original DCX was, was, I believe, about 20,000 pounds dry and was more yeah. of a tractor trailer uh, loaded. In Before fact, it, it ran through town a couple of times on its way back and forth from New Mexico and just between there sight. and LA. Before we answer questions, could I ask some kind individual in the back? Um, th these people have some nice beer here. 
to go into the cafe over there and get me a glass of water. I haven't eaten popcorn here. And I thought there was a water carrier in here. No, not a beer. i got to drive after this. Uh, could I ask somebody in, a, in anywhere in the audience just to go into the cafe and get me a glass of water, please? Oh, thank you, sir. Sorry about the interruption. Any, anyway, Sorry that that, that, that's, that's, the end of my, that's the end of my plug. That's the way I know to get people together and raise a little bit of money for a rocket company. It may not be, it may not be the most elegant way around, but you know, like, like Willie Sutton, you know, they, they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks. He said that's where the money was. I mean, Congress is where the money is. Okay. All right. Now, the one advantage from an anarchist working in suit, having a government, is that you have to seduce, bribe, blackmail only one lunatic instead of persuading 50 million people. Well, 535 in this case, or a majority of 535. Well, if you find a weak coin, like you said, though, a stampede one senator, one congressman, who's in the right, in the right committee and has nothing And he knows him. where the, the skeletons are hidden in the other 534. Okay. Or enough of them. All right, everybody in this room, take thou a great oath to go right to Senator Kyle, saying, please, sir, provide money for USL so we can get a working uh, space show that we'll, that we'll go to low Earth orbit and back reliably. Do you, do you really favor stuff. USL over uh, Aldrin's group? Are you making a, a well, unanimous the, agreement the, the, here? My, my take I don't is know. They're, they're, the, oh, they're the ones. Okay, I, I don't. I don't favor one over the other. Particularly, we'll probably be working to get Aldrin's group their earmark too, subject to talking to Aldrin's group and making sure they stop, you know, kicking into our own goal. And bad okay. mouth, and bad mouthing people are pushing in the same direction. Did I say that? No. <laughs> <laughs> This year but, we back USL. Next but, year we back Buzz Aldrin. But the, the, the point is, the, point, the, the, the main the main point is that NASA can't be relied on to make sensible selections anymore. At which point it's, it's up to us to more or less force sensible selections down their throat on the margin and little bits of money they can spare anyway. Sorry, what you saying? All this is a is a good idea. I mean, yeah. a, you know, a good bit of time here to find some good ways to generate support for the DCX program. Yeah. However, yeah. I thought the idea was to look for common ground well, uh, for yeah. various reasons, but I really don't think you're going to get a lot of people excited about transportation. Yeah. Well, well, if you, I think I've, I've, never, I've, I've never, I've I've never, I've never understood bigger that. To really get the public excited, and I really think it's going to take public excitement to get a lot going. Okay, Just like yeah. it took public excitement to get the war stopped. In that case, I can give another suggestion, one step at a time. For the past few months, I don't know if you've been noticing, but all the uh, documentary stations on the cable, uh, TLC, the Learning Channel, the History Channel, etc., have been pushing documentaries about oh, the danger of asteroids striking the Earth. And I suppose they got uh, a bit of a push from Armageddon and uh, Deep Impact. Point is, okay, this is a, cute, a good excuse, a good image, a good uh, cultural push, we can use it. Uh, we got to get into space in order to uh, get a, a platform to prevent those asteroids from hitting Earth. Hey, it's an excuse, it'll work. And um, uh, Les, the real dream is a long term thing. Les, we used that ploy uh, 28 years ago <laughs> to get the uh, satellite uh, tracking and surveillance program with a little add on into deep space. It worked, mm -hmm. only right now uh, the GIAD system and the other, other things are working better than we had thought, and they can probably track those things from the Earth at a lesser cost. In other words, Don't we, tell we used that threat to get a satellite tracking system, and now it works. So we can't use that threat again. Tracking, yeah, tracking is all well and good, but yeah, yeah, you have a to down. Down. Well, push them aside gently a long way out. Oh yeah, there's, there's nothing dramatic. in a satellite tracking system that, that means that once you found it, you could ever do anything about just, it. That's the next step. Just, that just, may be the next step. Just as an aside, and my take is that uh, if we get the ability to go out and push them aside gently, uh, if we get the ability to go out and redirect them a long way out, that probably in the long run increases the chances the Earth will get hit as opposed to decreases. Not but if we catch the set. That, that's just the being a pessimist about people. And instead of just gently pushing it aside, we also mine it for its goodies. That's, that's the next step after that. Yeah, you I, don't I don't think you follow what I was saying, but no. what I'm saying is once we've got that capability, people will really use it to drop rocks in their enemies' heads. They'll do that people in any case. 
And meanwhile, it doesn't matter if they throw uh, rocks at each other's heads or throw atom bombs. They're going to they're gonna, uh, do their stupid little thing anyway. And meanwhile, let's us get the technology to get the rest of us out into space. Oh. Idiots will be idiots. And, um, war, war crazed power judges will be war crazed power judges. Let's, let's just not do I'd the like idiots to, toys. I'd like, to go back to a previous, I'd like to go back to a previous question that I didn't really answer properly. It does need answering properly. Uh, this gentleman here was asking me if that, if that doesn't mean we're favoring DCX over other approaches, uh, pushing uh, for an earmark for USL. Uh, the deal is that other approaches are getting pursued at the moment, more or less sort of kind of in, 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 in NASA's inimitable way. Uh, this is an approach that NASA has been refusing to pursue assiduously for five years after it showed considerable promise on a very small budget. Mm -hmm. uh, we think it's probably a good candidate to be first to be shoved down their throat. And that's pretty much the answer. We, we, you know, we're perfectly willing to support other such. We, I've, I've talked to the startups and told them all we're changing policy. We're no longer just going to try to say, NASA, you should have a sensible program. Because we flat, flat, at this point we flat out given up on NASA making sensible choices. We'd like to be proven wrong. Uh, we're not counting on it. At this point, we're trying to force sensible choices down their throats as long as they're still designated as the sole national agency to develop a reusable launch. That means they lower their heads with their bosses. Let the boss stomp them. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, that was a previous question. Uh, there were other questions out there. Oh, John, what have yeah. you got? Well, I, the issue is not. Is not Delta Clipper, say, versus X-33 or whatever, but the whole issue of NASA, their tactic has been, in one case, to focus on more distant technologies that are like 10 years away, and so they're not really ready to actually build a flyable vehicle with those technologies, and the slightly nearer term technologies are too difficult to, 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 to prove you can go ahead and build a vehicle so the X-33 program is stalled. So the remaining question there, is there, then... There is a discontinuity there. NASA is very fond of extremely advanced technologies that they, they say won't be ready for flight for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Plus guaranteeing their only jobs. If, if technologies are just about ready for flight now, they shrug and say it's not their job. Exactly, exactly. So here's, so here's the question. There, there's another point could, that goes on with that too, and that's that NASA uh, has steadfastly refused to create a permanent habitat in space. The uh, space station will be visited by various crews, but as I said earlier, nobody is going to have a zip code of space well, as you, their permanent residence. There are a bunch of technologies that are required. You have got gravity. There are a bunch of technologies that are required for that long-term uh, habitation. The Russians explored a little bit of it with their year-long flights, but NASA has no interest and anybody going up there and staying up there. But isn't NASA that we have to convince you it's Congress? Because yeah. Congress is the keepers of the money. <laughs> well, let me finish my question earlier, which was, if, if, if you focus on what is the best <coughs> short-term, almost sure thing technology that we can do yes. to, get, to make a vehicle to replace <coughs> at least the shuttle for crew transfer, to, to at least take care of that problem, and so that we can then well, the eliminate the shuttle we can do program. Save massive amounts of money. There, that's and, true. You can save like three three billion dollars a year. And safety, right? So yours. Exactly. <laughs> but but you still need something to carry like space station payloads up and so forth. So it's got to be probably crew crew transfer plus some kind of a semi heavy lift. So Proton. what do you think is the best bet for well for existing expendable? That's true. It would reduce the cost, but. We, our politicians, it's going to be difficult for them to give up all our launch business, the Russians. So the choice is really between a single stage, which is a little bit riskier technology because we can't prove that we can do it this instant, or it's like a two-stage, which we're sure we can build. And I almost say, wow. go ahead and just build some kind of a totally reusable two-stage vehicle, even if the two vehicles are almost identical, he, and he just sure. so we have something. I, I'm not sure we can build it until we define who we is, what, what actual company and team and, and, right. and government that's, management that's there gets played. into it. There, there, are, there are any number of potential combinations I'm reasonably sure couldn't, no matter how much money you threw at them. Right. DCX yeah. is the most likely part of the The DCX has not only been tinned, but they've also actually flown the subscale. So yeah. they're probably first they had 
Roton has been tinned, and I know they've done the atmospheric on the, on the uh, helicopter plays a little bit, but they haven't flown it on the rocket engines yet, so they're a little bit far back. Buzz Aldrin's design, I like it, but he hasn't, it's still in the paperwork. So choose one. So choose the DCX first, it's, fur, it's the furthest along. Precisely. Right. And then Roton probably second, because it's next to it or something. And, and, and the, the best, this one this year, that one next year. Exactly. Year. In when, the best of all possible world, we'd proceed with a bunch of them in parallel. Yeah. See which, hmm. and see which ones succeed and which ones don't. But politicians don't Let think like that. Be. Put up a contest. That's what the last one was supposed to be, is this venture star, right? Whatever happened to it? Two years ago, we had three spaceships. Now we've got zero, right? No, the, the down select was in '96, and well, we, NASA insisted on down selecting the one and then shoveling all the money at that. And one of the contractors That's used political it. influence and money to make sure they got it, so it wouldn't come. My read is so that uh, essentially that nobody else would get it and compete with their existing expendable lines and existing existing space launch cash flow. Uh, that has come to be a fairly well accepted. <laughs> analysis of the Lockheed Martin strategy and the whole thing that they win even if they lose as long as they've tied up all the available development money none of their competitors are putting them out of the expendable business and out of their half of the, the USA shuttle alliance and that, that interlocutor business with NASA is what is going to have means we've got to go to get this through Congress well, what, whatever we do next it should it should fund at a much lower level multiple competitors whatever we do next why? You pick a different competitor every year. Because at that point, there's no political incentive for one <coughs> large outfit to go in. There's no ability for one large outfit to go in, suck up all the money, and essentially stop progress dead in the field because they benefit from stopped progress. Because they, they, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, each of them, between their expendable lines, their existing lines of expendable launch vehicles, and their half of the, the USA shuttle operating alliance, have several billion dollars a year in launch and space launch cash flow, current, pretty much guaranteed income every year, multiple billions of dollars, uh, on, on the order of two to three billion dollars, possibly more. I've added it up this recently. Is launch. This, this is satellite launch. This is this is this is satellite launch. This is is commercial and government satellite launch. This is their halves of operating space shuttle. That's existing cash flow. That's a dead cinch. Money in the bank, as far as they're concerned. Now, if either of them builds a new reusable launch vehicle, one, it's a risky thing. They may screw it up. Their engineering teams may screw it up. And two, even if it does succeed, who are they competing against? In large part, their own their own existing cash flow. If, if they can lower prices with the reusable launch vehicle, they've essentially spent a lot of research money and taken a risk to lower their overall revenue. They don't want to That's the way they're, they're, they're vested interest in Essentially, neither of them, neither of them, well, the, the other key factor is that the space launch mar market is fairly price inelastic until you get down to the oh, five, six, seven hundred dollars a pound, about, about a tenth roughly, a fifth to a tenth of current costs, depending on who you're buying from. Uh, the market doesn't really, according to the commercial space transportation study done a few years ago by an aerospace, the aerospace industry consortium, uh, if you lower prices down to about that point, you don't increase the total size of the market. You, you actually decrease the cash flow. So any, any reduction in launch costs up to about a factor of five to ten is self-defeating because you'll actually bring in less cash after you've spent all that money in R&D because you'll be charging less for launches uh, yet you won't be selling more launches, not significantly so. In that case, that's a good argument to use when trying to stampede Kyle uh, to uh, to have him fund somebody else. Look, these white elephants are not making develop are not developing anything because they want to keep the money exactly as it is from the well, state. They have no incentive to actually. Their 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 boards of directors should probably that's them. their their yes, boards of directors should fire. About. Yeah, but save the senator. Well, who else is in charge? Yeah, but between NASA, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin, who else is in charge? Well, this is what's got to be broken up. Precisely. Ah. Yeah. Therefore, it saves thou to the senator. Bingo. This white elephant is doing nothing but to restricting trade and eating money. Let's go to this little lean, mean company that uh, has, great, has great potential and much cheaper. 
Yes, but let's, not go, to, let's not go to just one little lean mean company. Well, they, did, year, they, did that, they did that a few years ago with orbital sciences. The theory was orbital was going to, oh, the, the old LTV scout expendable was putting 800-pound uh, payloads in orbit for about $12 million. Uh, orbital sciences came along and said, we can do this air launch boost and it's smaller and it'll cost less. We can do it for six or seven million dollars. Government and DARPA gave them a contract to develop it. Uh, lo and behold, by the time they were done and the government had essentially <coughs> driven Scout out of business by, by not giving them any, the government essentially shut them down. Uh, and lo and behold, Orbital was suddenly saying, oops, well, it costs more than we thought. It's going to be 15 million now. If you pay to develop a monopoly, what a surprise, you're going to pay monopoly prices. Remember the element of time. I said this year we pushed for um, uh, USL. Well, Two years later, we do the same thing over again, pushing for rotor. Well, we may push for Aldrin's people and Pioneer and so on, too. Mm -hmm. We'll know a month from now, and I've heard back from them. What is it? I've, I've been making the rounds talking to all the companies, seeing if any of them are up for this. And yeah, don't forget, politicians you, you understand two-year increments, therefore. You, you understand, going, going to get an earmark out of NASA is enough to mm -hmm. absolutely prevent you from ever getting a NASA contract for don't as long, as, NASA. For as, long as NASA. For, Precisely, we go over their heads. That's what you just mentioned. Which you said. You, said you got NASA. You got the, the two big monsters that are left in the aerospace. Congress provides money to NASA, but NASA has a lot of say over how it's spent and a lot of it. They shouldn't anymore. Precisely. Ah, uh, well, uh, tell that to President Clinton, who yes, back exactly. in the mid '90s said that exactly. NASA has sole responsibility for reusable launch vehicle development. Well, gee, the DCX is not as reusable yet; it's not expendable. <laughs> No, it was reusable until they broke it. You know, it was started over a department. That was why DCX got transferred over to NASA before NASA broke it, mm -hmm. uh, that specific policy. Well. well, anyway, can anybody think of anything else in the way of common yes. ground we for space an, advocates? We have to have an incentive could, to could we? Yeah, could we go back to raised hands, please? Can, can anybody else think of common ground? <laughs> common, <laughs> ground common ground for space advocates that might be worth pushing. Any ideas out in the audience? Yeah, we, we, we haven't. Yeah, but why don't we focus on the concept of looking for more applications for putting things in orbit, uh, things that would make various companies money so there will be a bigger demand for... If, if I can paraphrase, you're saying, why don't, we, why don't we concentrate on trying to find new market opportunities and expand the market? Well, one of the, one of the, Which would one be of the, a, would yeah, be one of the points that, that Zubrin makes is that uh, you, you, there's no incentive to decrease. It's just too small to justify the business case for the investment to develop the new vehicles. Um, I, I'm not sure what we can do to expand the markets, but anything you ind individuals could do to develop <coughs> new markets and, and develop them would be good. Uh, in the blue shirt. Yeah. I understand you say that again, you know, we're expanding the market. We've got the capability to expand the market, but we have a problem with uh, the department of uh, the transfer of technology. And they said Russia can only launch X amount of satellites because they have a problem with that. We can't use China's uh, long marches. So we should open that area to launch our vehicles there, our satellites there. Therefore, it would bring down the rest of them into a, a reasonable yeah, that's another good That's a, a key point because Russia has probably some of the best launch vehicles there are. It's, it's we're another using their point. engines right now. And our government is currently looking to essentially restrain international trade by uh, imposing, reimposing a quota on Russian launches of U.S. satellites. Mm -hmm. And on, the, on you, you can argue either way about protecting U.S. industry and so on, but on the whole, anything that drives prices down is probably to the good. Yeah, they were trying to do something. Now the European here said, hey, we can't trust America, so we'll go and do it ourselves. So well, we'll the Europeans a whole bunch of stuff because we are not looking into that avenue and working as a team versus we are the dominant factor in the world. Well, that would create competition, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be an excuse to stamp the accomplishment by saying, look, they're getting ahead of us. Well, that's the key to success there. Yep. Yeah. Okay, remember the minds that you're dealing with, politicians who think only two years ahead. <coughs> well, they wish to make money. Is one of them. That's not trying oh, to yeah, That's different. Now, there are bureaucrats who think 20 years ahead of their jobs and nothing else, but no. 
But seriously, right now, and for the next two to four to eight years, uh, the only way to make money out of space is uh, satellite launches, building the ISS, and eventually getting to the moon and mining it. Now, getting to the moon is something like is better than eight years ahead, which is uh, two, three congressional, more than uh, four congressional terms. So they're not going to think that far. What we can do is sell is tell them we can uh, make money selling transport to the station. We can make money tra uh, sell, uh, putting up launches cheap. That's the way to go right now, or for the next two years. I would just put, putting people into space for entertainment purposes is probably a bigger market than you know, mining the moon anytime soon. Mm -hmm. so how, how many, people, pushing, how many people in this room would take out the equivalent of a, a mid-priced mid, mid new car loan if, if for the price of that they could go go up to orbit for six hours and look out the window? Do a full-size car. Yeah, well, well call, call, it, call it a loan for $50,000. Oh, I don't get that. I'm, I'm not sure I could pay off. Oh, call, 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 okay, call it twenty-five thousand. I think I could probably pay that off. I'm there. Look out the window for six hours. Bring a camcorder. Have some memories. Yeah, I, I think we've just established there is a market. And now, whether whether somebody can develop on the basis of the size of that market, the vehicle the, that will carry us up there for six hours and get us back with a reasonable prospect of going in one piece. I'm sorry, uh, space shuttles. You know, one in one hundred or one in three hundred ain't good enough. Mm -mm. I'm not, I'm not saying I've turned down a ride on a shuttle if offered, but as far as a routine tourist market, it's not good enough. Uh, whether somebody can develop that vehicle and then get through all the regulatory hurdles and so on, uh, that, that's something we can be unified about. If somebody actually has a vehicle at the point of jumping the regulatory hurdles and those hurdles are being set too high, that's definitely a case for mass action. Well, the Russians have already taken a reporter into space and from Japan known. for pure commercial profit. Yeah, there's newspapers just you know, flat out paid cash to send him up. There was 10 million ones. Something like that. Word was he was space sick the entire time and miserable, hated it, <laughs> hated every bit of it. How was that tree find sensibilities? Seriously, what happened with that project people were talking about, about uh, zero G uh, um, manufacturing? Well, lots of different projects there. Typically what happens is a company will start, it will look at a process that you know, might be enhanced by zero G discover it takes three years to get something up into space to experiment with, so they'll tinker with it on the ground in the meantime, and what they'll do while they're tinkering with it is discover a better way to do it on the ground anyway without zero G, and at that point they just abandon the whole thing because they're tired of dealing with NASA and trying to get it up there three years from now. Well, the Russians are already selling uh, flights in their zero G aircraft, training aircraft. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's $1,500 a flight. Is I don't remember the detail. Going right. Uh, and you get uh, 30 or so parabolas, which is, oh, three quarters of an hour in, in weightless well, total. The, the Russians. And, and people are, are going over there to Russia uh, in droves to the extent that the Russians are, are considering converting two more aircraft uh, to the zero G configuration. You've got to do some things once, to the engines. And, once you've got and making it a straight tourist attraction. Once, once you've got it worked out. Once you get the bugs worked out on that, at this point, the Russians, through their U.S. marketing organization, Mircor, are selling flights to their space station to do long-term experiments. Cash on the barrel. Head. That's that's commercial flights, right? Can we? Oh yeah. As opposed um, to a tourist. Oh, Rick, Rick Tumlinson went over there and, and, and signed the agreement with Semyonov. Was over. Was was talking about it yesterday. Okay. Can we use the Russians are winning? The Russians are winning. There's an excuse to stand here to Congress here. Nah. How about doesn't, doesn't the Japanese are, no, Japanese are winning. No, we, did, we just told the, everybody that the Russians the are no longer a threat. Okay, the French are winning. The French are winning. Now there's a. <laughs> <laughs> the French are revolting. The French. No, no, no. no that's, They've always been revolting. <laughs> oh, well, okay. You, you've been being patient for a while. This is all small potatoes. Yes. I still believe in the original idea that started the L5 Society. Yes. You're, Jerry O'Neill project is the only thing that's going to ultimately work. And once it's done, all the rest of this is going to be fallout. We need to some, set some, up... Some of us, some let of us me finish, think you've please. got to take small I've steps to get there. Like you said, I've been patient. Let, let me finish. We need to set as a national goal energy independence for the United States of America with a clean, non-carbon fuel system involving solar power satellites. Once we have determined 
that we will do this, I think we can actually persuade, if we can persuade the American people for, for something that's going to take 10 years instead of seven years, <coughs> what we will end up doing is building a platform in space with a permanent habitat where we are sending energy down to this planet where we can make every American a billionaire, everyone on Earth a billionaire. Americans always want to be, live better and everybody on this planet wants to live as good as Americans. It comes down to how much energy you can pump into the economic system. When we do this, the door will be permanently open. Okay, can you write that into a, into a proposal in simple words that will stampede a group of congressmen? You're talking. You're talking to you one. You're to talking convince. to one of the people who's the reason why NASA is actually spending money on this again. That happened quietly a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't see any prospects for a crash national program because even when oil's expensive, oil is still cheap. It'll take a crisis. It'll take a crisis to kick this off, and we haven't had one lately. You you think we have to have the crisis, or can we my, possibly? My, my judgment of the situation, my opinion. Is that we're not going to make a commitment like that without a significant crisis? I, I, you have any thoughts I, that? I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, this this country does not make national policy decisions unless they've got uh, bloody well hell on their hands. And I think all you have to do is look at December seventh, nineteen forty one, to realize that this country generally does not get up to speed until something drastic happens. They get up to speed fairly well after that, but until something drastic happens like Sputnik or your bases are attacked, this country doesn't generally get behind a, an idea like that, no matter how good the idea is. Actually, this country is a lot like the space movement in that, getting back to the original subject yes. of this discussion. We don't really get behind any one thing until we have a real crisis on our hands and everybody can realize uh, there were a bunch of other... Like, now, if the I'm Russians sorry. put up a solar yes. power satellite, that's a crisis. Or if you can make politicians believe that the Russians or the Japanese or the French are about to put up a satellite. The French are winning, the French are winning. Well, Japanese, Remember what sort of creatures you are dealing with here. The minds of politicians and the, bureaucrats. The Japanese are looking at it, but nobody's going to believe a crisis anytime soon. Anyway, anyway question there. That was, the Jap that was the Japanese aspect of it. I think if you were to push the I, solar power satellites with the Japanese, uh, which and they need to be energy independent. Well, well, frankly, frankly, Japan and the U.S. have a common interest in, in selling in selling China cheap energy that doesn't involve burning soft coal up wind of us. I think that even even the threat of a satellite from Japan or France or Russia is not going to do it. And again, the reason when, when is they, when they, when they just start, before Sputnik and just before Pearl Harbor. All the experts were saying, they're about to do this. And our government sat there and did nothing until the news headlines hit. I'm not talking about a threat to do it. I'm saying push it so that they actually do it. A threat, what, what to, power, a threat to money. A threat doesn't work. They've got to actually put it in orbit so, I mean, or drop got, a bomb. Got, I'm not talking about a threat. Yeah, yeah, when, when you start to support them getting out there. When they start to be enough of them, we'll try to catch up. When there start to be enough of them that you can see them under city viewing conditions with the naked eye in the sky, at that point, you know, we'll start to wake up. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, we had a few others out there. I just want to say one more thing, and then I'll quit. <laughs> you say it's impossible right now because of the lack of crisis for the our country to do. I'm what saying, are in the, my opinion, it's very unlikely. What, what, what do you think are our chances? Saying it's impossible. What do you think are our chances that the national Space society can get back to its origins and push this as a central goal. Well, all the people who came out of the NSI would you know, argue over whether that's its origins. Um, I, th I think that you, you want my opinion of the chances of the National Space Society forming a consensus on that and, and supporting it en masse. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Get somebody and, really seductive to get on the internet and, uh, and persuade. I, I, I say that as an outsider who used to be a member of the organization, and, and, and just it, it's it's a very large it's a very large umbrella group, and it contains a lot of diverse interests, and it's very unlikely to unify on something like that unless there's a crisis. Anyway, uh, third third row back on the aisle there. Um, I just want to say something a little hopeful here. I think it's about to happen whether we like it or not, whether we wish it or not. Uh, two well, things have happened. 
We no longer control the technology for getting into space. All the information is out there. I can go over oh, here, yeah. scavenge it. The Russians have it, the Japanese have it, That's and it's in the, the international market. We don't control it. This it's about to break loose. Space rockets are not high tech anymore. They're medium tech. Yeah, yeah. It, it's become easier. Uh, but not cheaper. But not cheaper. <laughs> but it's going to because it's an international market and it's our international competitors who are going to do it. The question for us is what are we going to do after they save Mir, put up a tether, and all of a sudden Russia is running the hotels in space. Japan has their solar power satellite up because they want to get rid of their nuclear power plants because their people hate them so much. And what are we going to at do that at point, that point? At that point, the fine old American tradition is we panic and play leapfrog. Whether we still have that in us, well, time will tell. I hope we do. We, we do play catch up fairly well. We've got we have a lot of practice at it. We have in the past. We, we, we've the dissipated a lot of resources in the last decade or two. Well, not necessarily. I mean, we no longer have to spend all that money on beating the Russians. We have plenty of resources and plenty of, uh, there's a huge backlog and a, and a building pressure for getting into space, for spending the money on this. And a, and a, and a good housing crisis. The French are coming, the French are coming, why is do it? It's easier to pry resources loose from beating the Russians than it is to pry them loose from big screen TVs and new Nintendos. But you know, the biggest problem is we've got our kids nowadays are looking for the instant gratification and not the best party in the world. As a kid. So we overcome that. Oh. That, that points that points entirely yes, off the subject. But well, I've, I've, I've got an answer. Kid. I've got an answer to the Fermi paradox. Hmm. Fermi paradox being that you know if there's even the slightest you know, a chance of, of intelligent life arising, arising and then being able to travel between the stars. Okay, where are they? Because we should have been swarmed under. And he was mentioning that the kids are into instant gratification. Yeah, frankly, I think the reasonable chance is that intelligent species all invent virtual reality and then you know fold themselves into their own navel and never leave home again. Because it's so much more fun to you know, run a really realistic space flight simulation than it is to go to all the work of building a real one. Uh, Henry, <clears throat> just one data point. Um, I have flown the S-16 simulator. I have flown an S-16. The simulator, don't touch it. So it's not there yet. All you have to do is have a couple of kids actually go out there and look through the porthole and see space, and they're going to say, yeah, throw away the Nintendo. Real life is much more interesting trust, than video Trust games. me, Pete, the, 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 simulations, the simulations are getting better fast. I followed the trade. Give it 20, go give go it, fly the airplane. Give, give it's it, even better. Give it 20 <laughs> years, and you won't be able to tell the difference, except you walk away from the crash from the simulator. As <laughs> yeah, been a hedonistic kid, I can tell you that when you when you play games over and over, they get they get boring, yeah. and you start looking for new thrills. Oh, you, you play games you get, against plays games against live opponents. Trust me, they won't get boring. Now, even yeah, after a while, even that gets boring. You, you start creating bigger thrills, which take a longer time to to accomplish. Do more work. The older you get, the more esoteric your taste for fun gets. And so, as both of us are still pretty simple for the world, but. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not worried about the kids being uh, uh, too hedonistic to uh, to consider space. No, I'm, I'm worried about the bottleneck on the natural development, which is what we've got to get around. Anyway, yeah, question out there. Most of the commercial uh, payloads would be launched by something like Roton are in the light to medium range, but. To support a major human expansion into space, we're going to need a heavy lifter of at least well, Saturn V or Ergia class. Uh, uh, you're, you're, say, you're saying a major human expansion in space would require a heavy lifter? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, the, alternative, the alternative is lots of cheap light to medium flights and an ability to assemble things in orbit. Instead of sending up PhDs who you know, don't mind getting their hands dirty, send, send up mechanics who don't mind getting into a suit and working with a wrench. You know, I can't imagine any version of a Roton that could put 100 tons in Leo. Oh, a Roton? No, Gary Hudson would be the first to tell you that that does not that scales up only to a very limited extent. Um, and strictly because of the rotor blades, the, the the generic vertical takeoff rocket vertical landing vehicle can scale up as far as you want to, though. Uh, the practical limit is ground handling. If you get a very big, heavy lift version, it's going to be a real bear to move around on the ground and gets more expensive to operate. You, t you tend to only use something like that for specialized flights. Uh, but the, the original DC-3 had a 5,000-pound payload on a good day. 
and they managed to fight World War II using that as pretty much the primary cargo aircraft, uh, the C-47. Uh, light to medium will do the job. You learn how to do everything as a series of light payloads. You simply learn to curve up all payloads into 5,000 pound chunks and then produce a lot of C-47s. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's doable that way. You, you could build, you would have to actually build, say, a Mars ship in orbit. You couldn't just, you know, launch big modules and plug them together. You would have to actually, you know, construct and weld the thing together in orbit, which uh, one of the dirty little secrets of NASA is the spacesuits they've been using ever since Apollo give the people who use them marginal cases of bends just about every time. They are right on the hairy edge of getting the bends. They're getting joint pains. They're probably taking physiological damage. They don't, you know, they don't bitch about it because they'd stop being astronauts at that point. But they don't particularly like going out in those suits because they're operating, I believe it's 3 PSI oxygen, and the pre-breathe period is just marginally adequate if you look at the Navy I think it's 3.6, but yeah, it's in that range. Yeah. Uh, what a juicy scandal for discrediting NASA. Has anybody made a better suit? <laughs> um, as Matt, NASA Ames was working on, on hard suits that would, you know, atmosphere, you know, regular the, atmosphere the pressure. The David Clark company makes them all, and they've made them all since Mercury. Uh, uh, no uh, competitor. A, a guy named Vic, uh, Vicu Cal, or Vic, Vicky Cal, Indian gentleman at NASA Ames was working on uh, ro rotating, you know, hard armored suits with rotating uh, joint seals that would work at atmosphere pressure out at NASA Ames, and it was it was quietly ignored by the NASA Johnson Hamilton Standard Suit Monopoly up until the point where some of us tried to make a fuss and give them some more money, at which point they got shut down. Hmm. You know, Hamilton Standard's getting several hundred million a year for those suits. Did they and, buy Clark? Pardon? Did they buy Clark? Who? David Clark made them all. No, David, David Clark makes diving suits, doesn't he? Hamilton Standard it makes, makes NASA suits. Did, no, David Clark has nothing to do with it as far as I know. Uh, uh, but as, as, I said, as far as orbital assembly goes, it, yeah, as, as I said, a, a, a non-scandal, an ongoing non-scandal is that NASA really hates doing that. Uh, for good reason, because the suits they're uh, stuck with for political monopoly reasons are, are, are marginal. And okay. the marginal things to the people who wear them for six hour shifts a couple times a shuttle flight. You must find somebody who can and has designed for making a better suit, then they get a big noise about scandal lawsuit on uh, NASA's bad suit. Well, NASA, bad NASA, suit lawsuit. That NASA's good. going to create a crisis because somebody was uh, somebody was pointing out the other day that uh, the official station assembly sequence is up to, up to they're calling for something close to 500 EVAs, 490 something, mm -hmm. uh, to complete it. In that case, I recommend that we all get press releases ready to throw it. Uh, yeah, as we yeah. are, have, call up your media, your nearest media station, and say, "Here, I'm an expert. Here, my list of letters to prove it, and I know what caused this this uh, catastrophe. It's a scandal at NASA. They had they, they had possibly possibly for something better, and they blew it. Well, they, they scandal, don't, scandal. But they don't have a scandal. They just have you know astronauts with a little bit of nerve damage and a little bit of chunk pain. You know, marginal, a... marginal bends results. Okay, and they don't those... say a damn thing because they might want to fly again sometime. I was I heard it described as less damage. I heard it described as less damage than you get in boot camp and you already went through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. but most of them aren't as young as the kids the kids going through boot camp, that being as it may. Um, I just want to have a suit. Lawsuits oh. can do marvelous things. No. Any, anyway, we're, we're, we're up to 5.42 in the evening. We've got a musical performance coming up at 6 over in the ballroom for it. And, and uh, uh, musical performance and reception at 6 p.m. over in the Empire Ballroom foyer. All right. Not to mention 7 to 10 p.m. the NSS Awards Banquet. If you've got tickets, enjoy it. Right. If not, we'll meet you at the bar. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I guess that wraps this thing up.